Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. A way maker where there seems to be no way. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. A light to our path. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Bless the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. I love that. He never stops working. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, I work and my Father works. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. It's not based on what we're seeing. It's not based on what we're feeling. It's based on what He is doing. Praise God. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank the Lord. God bless you. you may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Ooh, praise the Lord. Beautiful presence of the Lord here this morning. Praise God. We know He's always with us, but sometimes it's more tangible than others. Praise the Lord. And we just appreciate that. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. And thank you, Tim. As always, great job. I, I, it, it never ceases. I say this every week, but I, I can't help myself because it never ceases to amaze me how that God uses Tim to bring kind of things together and uh, solidify what it is I feel like he's been saying to me. And it just it's miraculous. And then how that witness kind of just carries through all the testimonies and the even the prayer request, so it's it's powerful, and that's it's encouraging, amen. And uh, as I'd hate to think it was up to me to come up with something uh, to bless anybody. Praise the Lord, but it's it is the Lord, Hallelujah. Thank you, Tim. Again, praise the Lord. Thank all of you for being here. It's great to see y'all, because as many people as we've had since this things got started. Praise the Lord. So it's great to see everybody here again. Great to see Eric back there on the. On the computer, on the uh, soundboard again, amen, that's great. This kind of looks normal, amen, so it's, that's nice, amen. And I do want to thank Suzanne and Mike, as always, for carrying on and doing all that they do. Suzanne, especially for last week, thank you, and God bless you for taking the service on short notice and bailing me out, and, amen, and, and being a blessing to everybody. I got to listen to the message after. I didn't hear it live, but I got to hear it immediately afterwards, and it was a tremendous message. It blessed me. and. I know it did everybody that was here and that were able to, to uh, experience it over the internet as well. So thanks again for that. And uh, Darlene and Don, still back from Arizona, loving the heat and humidity here, I'm sure. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Even it's been stifling this past week, but God is good. Amen. And air conditioning solves a lot of issues. Praise God. But thank the Lord. Appreciate everybody being here. Thank you all for your testimonies and your prayer requests and sharing those needs with each of us. And to everybody out there on the internet, God bless you and thank you for being with us as well. You're an integral part of the service and uh, it isn't about uh, physically being here, although that's, that's great for us that are here, but uh, it is about us being one in the spirit and uh, we can do that wherever we are. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. So uh, it's that time that you've all been waiting for, I'm sure. Knock, knock. King Tut. King Tut who? Kent. I almost couldn't say it. King Tucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> King Tutty Fried Chicken. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Don. Praise the Lord. No, it's part of about self abasement here, so it's. Amen. It's all about me one way or another. Praise God. You know why you can't trust Satan's resume? The devil lies in the details. <laughs> I noticed this too. People who lack the patience for calligraphy will never have properly formed characters. <laughs> okay. I bought a wooden whistle, but it wouldn't whistle. So I bought a steel whistle. But it still wouldn't whistle. So I bought a lead whistle. But it still wouldn't let me whistle. 
That's about as bad, I think, as I've ever had. <coughs> Those are the ones I really like. <sighs> Praise the Lord. The worse, the better. Amen. Well, thank God for, uh, for making it through the week. We had all kinds of junk going on here the last couple of weeks, and God has gotten us through all of it, and I'm just excited to be back here today and to share a few things with you that I feel like God has put on my heart. So with that in mind, let's go directly to 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. Praise God. When the servant, now this, I'm, 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 I, because of the message Susan preached last week, it was hard for me to get off of. She did a, a fantastic job. Any of y'all that heard it and uh, were here to witness it, it was a great message. So it kind of, some of those things kind of echo back. You know, it's hard to get rid of them. Uh, plus, I'll steal anything from anybody if I get the chance, praise the Lord. But anyway, when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, and a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. Praise the Lord. Matthew 13, uh, verses 3 through 16. Matthew 13. 3 through 16. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. Forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away that what he has. Praise the Lord. Therefore, speak I to them in parables, because they seeing not, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and shall not perceive. Praise the Lord. For his, this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are full of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, dull of hearing, I'm sorry, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and be converted, I sh and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Acts chapter 28, verses 23 through 27. Acts 28, verse 23 through 27. Praise the Lord. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning until evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believe not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So sight is a function of the eyes, while vision is a function of the heart. Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Genesis 3, 4 through 7. 
We're all familiar with this. This is Adam and Eve and the serpent lying and deceiving. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. So the greatest gift that God gave to humanity is not the gift of sight, but the gift of vision. See, too many people have sight, but no vision. Physical sight is the ability to see things like they are. Vision is the ability or the capacity to see things as they could be. And that takes faith. Proverbs 23, 5 through 7. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee. But his heart is not with thee. So like Adam and Eve, we can't let what our eyes see determine what our hearts believe. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Is this we are to walk by faith, right? Praise God. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Now just think about that. I mean, that's something we all know and we, we, we say it all the time. We think about it. But it's, it's so powerful. To walk by faith is to live by faith is, what, is just another way of saying that. So in other words, we're supposed to walk according to what's in our hearts. Now, God said, I've given them my law, but I'm going to put it in your hearts. In other words, I'm going to put my word so that the principles are there. Even if you don't know the scripture, as Rita was talking about, and it happens to all of us, we, it, it's in our mind, but we can't pick out, we can't give you the verse or the chapter or the book, but we know it's there. We, we, we know it. It's in our heart, right? And that's what he's talking about here, that we, we're supposed to let what's in our hearts dictate how we see life, not what we see with our natural eyes, but what we know to be true in our heart, which is the word of God, right? Matthew, let's go back to Matthew again quickly, 13, uh, verse 15 and 16 again. And this is the challenge, and this is called walking by faith. This people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, <coughs> excuse me, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. He's talking to believers. And you know this is true. You can share stuff scripturally with an unbeliever. It's like they don't get it. It's like you're talking to them in a foreign language, literally. And it makes total sense to us, and we're thinking, why can't you get this? Why don't you understand what I'm saying? You know, this, this is what's going to bless you. And they look at you like, you know, you're from another planet. Unless the Holy Spirit's drawing them, unless the Holy Spirit's dealing with them, right? So look at Genesis again. Let's go back to Genesis 11, uh, verses 29 and 30. <clears throat> this is talking about Abraham. God's making promises to Abram. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. <coughs> Excuse me. But Sarai was barren, and she had no child. So now God is starting to deal with Abraham, or Abram at this point, about what he's going to do for him. But he's being set up. His wife, I mean, the, the whole point of what God's going to do in the future for Abram is for to change his name to Abraham, a father of many nations. I mean, it's idiotic. It's almost like embarrassing, you know, from a natural perspective to think, okay, God's going to give me this promise with a woman that's barren, with a woman who's never had kids and never could have kids, you know, in the natural. All right, look at chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 3. Praise God. 
Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thee thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now you've got to think naturally here. Abram's going to take a leap of faith here, because this is going totally against everything that he sees and knows to be true, right? All right, uh, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, again, this is, this is what God does. He doesn't do the easy thing. He doesn't do the thing that would come natural to us or to our natural understanding. He does it in a way that it requires faith, that you have to use faith. Amen? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So he's saying, I'm the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I'll make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy sh name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be, a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Praise the Lord. Now you cannot, I mean, we look at this and say, well, you know, he took his bond servant and then had, uh, you know, the other child. And Hey, it actually makes some sense in the natural. Because this guy's 100 years old. His wife's barren, has been all of their married life. And he's thinking, okay, God's making a promise. I've got to figure out somehow to make this. This is exactly what we were talking about earlier, thinking that I can do this somehow. There's a way for me to make this happen, right? And all we do is screw things up. So when we have a vision, and this is what God was giving him. He gave him a word so that he could have a vision or see things differently than what he had been seeing them all along, right? And so when we have a vision... We are governed by the faith that God has put in our hearts by His Word. It was God's Word that Abraham was putting his faith in, not Sarah's womb or his ability as an old man to, you know, to have children. Praise the Lord. So God gave him a vision. He gave him something to look to rather than his normal natural circumstances and surroundings. Praise the Lord. Amen. Look at Hebrews 11 and 1. Hebrews 11 1. So... Faith is, he says, faith, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So I define faith as a vision in the heart. Now Suzanne said it this way, and we had talked over the phone prior to her, the message, and she was sharing some of this stuff with me. And she had said faith, or she said, she said it's now. It's the whole idea of being in the now, because God is always in the now. He's not in the future. He's not, he, he is the past. He is the future. But it's always now to him. That's why eternity, there isn't any you know, bad choices that you missed up or whatever. And there's no fear or anxiety of what may come. It's always right now. It's always right now in the presence of God. Amen. And so faith is seeing the future in the present. Amen. I am. It's, it's, everything comes to now. That's, what faith, that's how faith really works. It's not looking to the future, what might happen, what could happen. It's not looking to the past to see how I fouled up or, or what went wrong. Or in the case of a death of a loved one, I've had them and we prayed and believed that they were going to be healed. And you know what I'm saying? Now, we've seen people healed. We've seen people delivered and raised from the dead for that matter. But there's always that contradiction that comes in the natural to try to draw you back into what you're seeing and what you're experiencing in the natural realm. Amen? And so... Faith is seeing the future in the present or seeing God in everything now, right at the moment. Amen. So if you're operating by sight, you see the problems, you see the challenges, you see all the circumstances that are around you. Amen. Sight without vision is dangerous. Amen. Because it doesn't have any hope. 
it's stuck with whatever you're looking at. It's stuck with whatever there is, and it's going to tell you, no hope in this. I mean, it ain't going to get any better. This is horrible. We're all messed up. And it's going to get worse, praise the Lord. Well, life is full of depressing things. If you've lived any length of time, you know that. Now, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just saying it's a fact. So we have to learn to live by vision and see with the eyes of faith rather than with our natural eyes. Praise the Lord. Now, remember, I said sight is the ability to see things, amen, as they are. And vision is the ability to see things as they could be. In fact, I'd go a step further and define vision as the ability to see things as they should be. Yes. Praise the Lord. In agreement with what, what God's Word says. That's how it ought to be. That's how it's supposed to be. Amen. So we're being bombarded with discouragement and fear-based words. Statistics. Amen. I, I mean, I watch a little bit of it and then I have to turn it. It's just depressing. And it's constant. Every 10 minutes there's an update, you know, and it's, they don't know. Don't tell me you have answers, because if you did, something would be done. We would be doing something other than trying this and then trying that. It's hit or miss. It's a crapshoot. Amen. I don't want to discourage anybody, but amen. Mark Twain said it best. He said, lie, there's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics. Yeah. And it's the truth, because you can make statistics mean whatever you want them to mean. You can twist them to fit whatever your agenda is, you know. And so, praise the Lord. But even though we're hearing and seeing temporary things, they can still distress us. They can still depress us, even though we know that they're temporary. Because if we can see them, they have to be temporary. Amen. But the visions in our heart are greater than our environment. Amen. God gave us His Word, which is faith for a vision. For the vision to come to pass. That's what he gave Abram. He gave him his word. You're going to be the father of many nations. So he put something in him to put faith in or to put hope into. Amen. And so he gives us his word or his faith for vision so that we wouldn't have to live by what we see. So we don't have to go by what we're hearing on the news and what somebody else is telling us or what they've experienced or any of that stuff. Look, let's go back again to Genesis 1 and verse 26. And this is how God created us. And he said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So the word image refers to us as being created in God righteous. Adam and Eve were without sin. They were innocent. And that's how he says, we're going to create them. We're going to create man in our image. In our image, they're going to be righteous. They're going to be holy. They're going to be without sin. Amen. That's how we get born again. That's what happens when we get born again. But that was always God's original intent. It never changed. He just had to go about it in a different way after man fell. So, first of all, the word image refers to our moral or spiritual character, while the phrase in our likeness means to function like. So we're created holy and righteous and pure, and then we're created in His likeness, meaning in order to live that out, we've got to live the way God lives or operate the way God operates. Amen? So in other words, we're created to live according to the nature of God and to function as He functions in the world. We're to live as though we never sinned. We've never had any unrighteousness in our life. We don't have any negative uh, emotions or thoughts of our past or failures or present failures or any of that. Amen. We're, we're in the now. We're always in the right now with God, totally accepted in the beloved. Amen. And so we have to operate in that way. And, and so we function as He functions in the world. In other words, we work the way God works if we want the results that God has promised us. Amen. Hebrews 11 and 6. And here's where so much of religion fails. It isn't that, the, I don't think religion in, intentionally tries to lead people astray. I think it just doesn't get the spiritual reality of what is going on, and so they just keep dumbing everything down to natural stuff, and it doesn't work. But without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How do we seek him? By faith. That's the only way you can seek him. That's how you get born again. You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, right? And so, here, he's, if, you try to, if you try in any other way than faith, you're going to malfunction. 
That's why religion doesn't produce anything except guilt and shame and anxiety and all of that. This is about faith. This is about a relationship. Amen. And so and, and, and to try to approach God or to receive from God in any other way by faith, is, it's malfunctioning. It's, it doesn't work. Amen. And that's why worry is ungodly. Amen. Fear makes your vision short circuit. Amen. It, it just does. It, 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 that's why I'm saying I don't have to watch it. I'm not against watching the news. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be ignorant of what's going on. But at the same time, I don't want somebody else dictating to me or defining what my reality is going to be. Amen. Just because it's happened to somebody else. Amen. And so that's worry is ungodly. That's why he says, cast all your care upon me. Fear not. Right? Over and over and over. Fear not. We were never meant to be afraid. Now that's a, that's a huge challenge because we all have been in fearful situations and frightening circumstances. But look at David. You can't tell me, David, there wasn't a sense of fear. Knowing this guy, he's lived his whole life as a warrior. He's a giant. He's huge. He just, if he lets loose of that spear, I'm done. But yet his confidence was not in what he could do to Goliath, but what God would do for David. Yes. Amen. And so Jesus was filled with faith. He was the calmest person on earth. I mean, think about it. And he had people trying to freak him out all the time. Oh, what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do? Right? They were, you know, and you know how it is. You can try to stay calm in a situation, but if everybody else is freaking out, at some point you've got to just say, shut up or let me get, get away from you. You know, you're freaking me out. You're scaring me more than the situation is. Panic is chaotic. Amen. So look at this. We know this very well, but let me go back to it quickly. Mark uh, chapter 4, 37 through 40. Tim has referred to this multiple times, and rightfully so. Because it's a situation we all find ourselves in at times. Amen. And we've talked about it. Where is God? You know, I've been believing for this for uh, how many years, you know, and it hasn't happened yet. Where is God? What have I done? What's it? Why is he mad at me? Why isn't he giving it to me? Right? And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him, and they said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to, unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He didn't jump up and go, Oh, my God, why did you wake me sooner? No, he just gets up and speaks to the situation, uses his authority, right? And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? If you have faith, you can sleep through a storm too. Even the plans and the schemes of the devil work to believers' benefits. Think about it. The biggest plan that he had was to crucify Jesus. I'm going to take care of this problem once and for all. I'm going to kill the God that I wanted to replace. Amen. I will ascend to the heavens. I will be God, right? I'm going to kill the God that came here to take my place. The dumbest thing he could have done, but seemed like genius to him at the time. So here's what I'm saying. God uses that to show us that the most dramatic, the most in-depth, the most, what we would think, humanly genius kind of plans that the devil can come up with, amen, work to our benefit. Yeah. They have to work to our benefit. Romans 8, 28 and 29. Yeah. I know it's hard to look at this and say, there can be good come out of it. I guarantee you, if this came from the devil, God will use it to bless us. Ultimately, we are going to be blessed and the devil is going to get a black eye and a humiliation just as he did when he crucified Jesus. Had we known this, we never would have messed with it. Had we known what the outcome of COVID-19 would be to the believers, we would have never started the mess. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Praise the Lord. So, how does faith work? Look at Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12. Thank you, Jesus. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? 
Now, what he says he saw is not what was there. It's the vision that he had. And he said, I see a rod of an almond tree. And then the Lord said unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. God says, I'm watching to see that my word is fulfilled. And the New American Standard says, I'm watching over my word to perform it. To make it come to pass. Praise the Lord. Look at John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Praise the Lord. So God always brings His Word into being. Praise the Lord. The Genesis creation, all about words. Right? It was chaos until God spoke. Started speaking words. That created everything. And that same word sustains everything. So then he takes it a step further and he brings that word, he makes that word manifest in physical form, in a human being. Praise the Lord. Jesus was the word made flesh. Amen. So God created everything by speaking his thoughts into being. Praise the Lord. Nothing on earth is more important than a thought. Amen. Thoughts are more important than words because words are produced by thoughts. Thoughts are more important, the most important things on earth. But words are the most powerful things on earth. While thoughts design a future, words create that future. Nothing happens until you start talking about it. Amen? You can think about something for 20 years. Right? You can dream about it for 25 or 30 years. But that's not going to bring it to pass. Creative power is not in thoughts alone. It's in the words that come from those thoughts. Praise the Lord. Matthew 13, 19 through 23. Matthew 13, 19 through 23 says, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. And this is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that receives seed into stony places is the same as he that heareth the word, and Anon, or shortly after, with joy receives it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, and by and by he's offended. That's when we have a word from God, and we stand on that word, but we don't see anything come to pass. Time goes on, and we begin to to question and begin to doubt and begin to believe the stuff that we're seeing rather than the promise that God has given us. Amen. He's, we're, we get offended. We get frightened. We get nervous. We get uptight. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this word, world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the, world, the word and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So the good ground is the person who receives it into their heart, amen, and brings forth or understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Understandeth it means to, what do we say? I see what you're saying. It's having a vision. It's having a, it's more than just an intellectual assent, but it's actually receiving that word. Understanding what God is trying to do. Amen? Praise the Lord. So, uh, the devil knows that the key to creating anything is having a clear vision of it and speaking it into existence. He wants you to speak negative. He wants you to speak contrary to the Word of God. He wants you to speak carnal words that are Interacting with the natural stuff that we're seeing and experiencing. Amen. So your effectiveness in God's kingdom will be negated. If you just talk like everybody else talks, you're going to get what everybody else gets. Yeah. Philippians 4.19. So this is interesting. He says, 
My God will supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. That's great, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. But that word or vision for your life doesn't have any power unless you're willing to talk about it. It's just here. It's the thoughts of God. But they need to be manifest. They need to come alive. And the way that happens is by speaking. Yeah. By saying. So I'm at, the question is, do you have sight? Or do you have vision? Jesus continually dealt with the sight of his disciples. Because their sight was always getting them into trouble. Remember, I was just thinking of the one where the, the, the boy with the seizures and and said he would foam at the mouth and fall on the ground and flop around. And I guarantee you what they were seeing freaked them out. It made it almost impossible for them to have a vision of the kid being healed. And that's what Jesus had to deal with. That's why he said, oh, you have little faith. He wasn't really rebuking them. He said, you're looking at things naturally here. You're letting your sight dictate what's going to be the reality here. And God has given you a word that by, you know, you're, he, he, lay hands on the sick and they'll, be, they'll recover. They'll be healed. Amen? He wanted them to move from sight to vision. Amen? And that's why he taught them about faith through life illustrations, through parables or through the fig tree, the experience there, or the feeding of the 5,000 people. What's possible? Right? They're saying, we only got, look, what we've got. We can see what we've got's not enough. And he said, no, you need a vision that there are no limits with God. Amen? There's no lack. He'll supply your needs according to his riches and glory. Amen? Raising Lazarus from the dead. Well, we know there will be a resurrection someday. He said, no, you're, you're, th you're thinking in the natural here. And I'm trying to get you to see with vision by the word of God. He can rise right now. He can come back to life immediately. Because he wasn't dead. He was only asleep. I thought about this last week uh, at the funeral. When the prodigal son, you know, I was talking about Jesus stood up when, 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 uh, Stephen was stoned to death. And it's because he was going to receive him. He, was, he stood up to greet him as he came into heaven, into, the, into that realm. And because everywhere else it says he's seated at the right hand of God. Well, then you think about the prodigal son. And what's this say? The father's standing. He's, he's looking every day. He's watching for that boy. Oh. And he said when that boy came, he ran to him. I Take a doke. This is my son who was dead. In your world, he was dead, but he's not dead. He's alive forevermore. Yes. And he rode, ran to him and gave him the robe of righteousness and sandals on his feet and the ring of authority. He said, this is my son. Wow. He's always been my son. And now he's back home. Wow. He was in him before the foundation of the world. Yes. Praise the Lord. The way you see things determines how you think and act. And so then whether or not your vision becomes a reality. If you let the natural dictate, believe me, that's your reality. And the people that do that, they'll argue with you all day long because, look, this is my history. This is what, yeah, you're going to have to change from seeing to having a vision or it will never change. Not because God doesn't want it to change, but it's the only way that God can deal with us. He's, he's given us authority. He's given us the right to choose. We have to choose vision. We have to choose His Word over circumstances. That's what Jesus did day in and day out for all the years that He was here on this earth. And certainly for the three and a half years of His ministry. Everything He did, He was trying to teach His disciples, you cannot live this life by sight. It has to be by vision. It has to be by the Word of God. Amen. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, right? Not in his head, in what he really knows. So that's what he is. That's what he's going to have. That's what he'll be. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Well, I've been waiting. I hear this, you know, and I get it. I understand it because the thoughts come to me too. I've got promises that I haven't seen manifest yet. 
So I can either throw up my hands and say, well, I guess I misunderstood it. Or I can keep the faith, stand, amen, and get the result that God wants me to get. But i got to use faith to do that. He won't just push it on me because I'm feeling pitiful. Because I'm feeling sorry for myself. Because it didn't work, right? Hallelujah. I've been waiting. Nothing's happened. I know the temptation is to just say, oh, forget it then and let's move on to something else. You know, there's still a God, but apparently he's not going to do that. You just unraveled your promise. You just brought it back into the natural. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 2. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and you not hear me? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. All the problems I got, all the difficulties I'm going through, all the disorder, all the corruption, all the destruction, all the death, and you're not doing anything for me. Why? I mean, I, 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 this echoes, I'm sure, throughout the world. Habakkuk 2, verses 2 through 4. Praise the Lord. And the Lord answered me, and he said, Write the vision. Make it plain upon tables, that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Amen. So the word or the vision that you've received awaits an appointed time. It's speaking concerning the end. Right? That's what he's saying. Not the end of life, not the end of the age, but the end of the fulfillment of your faith. If God gave us His Word, He's given us vision. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. The end of your faith will produce exactly what God promised if you don't give up, if you don't stop using faith and fall back to the natural realm where you're saying, well, if it's going to happen, surely it would have happened. You know, we start thinking time and age and all those kinds of things. And he's saying when you do that, you're not walking by faith. You prolong the end. He's not talking about the end of the world, the end of the, you know, your life. He's talking about the end of your faith. When your faith comes to fullness, it has to produce. That's the vision he's given us. We just can't lose the vision and go back to sight because then we lose the result. You can't operate in faith by sight. It's... it's counterintuitive. I mean, just turn on the news. It's not faith. It's not building faith. It's not encouraging. Because even when they try to be encouraging, they're still depressing me. Because I know they don't know what they're talking about. They're just trying to convince us that they know something. But what they know is temporary. What they know is only natural. They don't know the truth. And the truth is what's going to set us free, not more information. Praise the Lord. God's saying, if I gave you my word, vision, don't worry if it seems like it isn't happening. It'll come to pass. Meanwhile, the righteous will live by his faith. Faith in what God has said. Even though it hasn't happened, we're still going to believe it. Listen, this is the ultimate. This is what Jesus did on the cross. Right? Right? He's got every reason to believe God has abandoned him. He even said it. But he said, nevertheless, he gave up the ghost. Why? Because of his faith in the fact that God, even if he went to hell, God was going to resurrect him and bring him back. He believed in what God had said in spite of everything else. He kept the vision. Now, if anybody had a reason to throw up their hands and give up, it would have been him. After the, all the humiliation, all of the suffering, all of the stress and everything that he had been through, and still continue to believe that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, and I will raise him up and be seated at my right hand. 
when every single thing in life in reality was saying just the opposite. And you can bet hell was just having a, a, a party like it was 1999. They were going berserk. We got him. We finally got him. Look, he's dead. He's going to die and we're going to have him. Only to find out they had no clue what God's plan was and how powerful faith is in a vision. Revelation 12 and 11. So we're in a time now where faith is being tested, not by God, but by circumstances, by life. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. In other words, they didn't let what might happen to them keep them from believing what God had said and confessing that. Amen. Romans 8, 35 and 37. Praise the Lord. Romans 8 and verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. That's what it looks like in the natural. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Through the living word of God that was manifest in this earth. That dwells within us. And it's those who endure to the end who succeed. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16. He that endureth to the end. The end of what? The end of your faith. He that doesn't give up. That hangs on to his faith. Amen. It will, they'll see it come to pass like Habakkuk said. It will happen. The vision will take place. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Darlene was talking about this. What is our ministry? To reconcile people to God. In other words, to get them to understand God's not mad at you anymore. He got All of his anger was poured out on Jesus. Anybody that goes to hell is not going to hell because God's sending them there. They're going to hell because they're rejecting the one way out. So neither do men light a candle and put it in a bushel, but on a candlestick and gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. God works is what that's talking about because there's only one that's good. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the, God, the good works or the God works are the miraculous, the supernatural. Right? The gifts of the Spirit. Amen? God has put so much into us that nothing can stop us. Except us. There's not enough darkness in the world to extinguish the light that God has put in us. That's why he said when darkness increases, when darkness is everywhere, the light of God will shine brighter. Why? Because we are not going to quit believing God. We're not going to let the natural dictate to us. We are going to be like a, like a city on a hill, like a light Amen. On a candlestick, not hidden under a bushel, but standing and shining. Amen. Psalms 36, verse 7 through 9. What's happening is we're going to have to just grow up and be who God said we were. You know, it's like being an adolescent. It's, you want to be an adult, right? And so you try to act like an adult. Maybe you'll smoke some cigarettes or drink a little booze or... Or, you know, do whatever to make you feel like you're an adult. Right? But eventually, you realize behavior doesn't make the person. It's their knowing. It's their how they react to situations and circumstances. I mean, just because, you know, back in the day when I was a kid, everybody smoked. I mean, nearly everybody smoked. And so it was almost like a rite of passage. Well, if I'm going to be an adult, I, I, if I start smoking, I'll... Uh, People think I'm an adult, right? I know, I know it's ignorant, but that's just that's the way it is. And it's the same way with drinking and different things. It makes you feel like I'm grown up. No, you're not. You're just a stupid kid who doesn't know enough that smoking is stupid even for grown-ups. Yeah. You know? But you're trying to make yourself something that you're not, that if you would just stop and slow down, you'll become that. You'll be that. 
It'll happen. You don't need to try to make it happen. You just need to go with the flow, right? So how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God? Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. Thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life. And in thy light shall we see light. Praise the Lord. Psalms 119, 105 through 107. Psalms 119, 105 to 107. Thank you, Jesus. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments or your word. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, Lord, according to your word. Not according to my circumstances, not according to my thinking, according to your word, according to the vision. Amen. Let, my, let me light up with the vision. Praise God. Hebrews 6, 12. See, the light of God's vision in our heart is so strong. It's so bright that all of the darkness in the world and the darkness of other people's opinions and all the darkness of past failures cannot put that light out. It's the light of God. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Praise the Lord. How do you inherit the promises? Faith and patience. The end must come. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. And then he gives us an example. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Your confidence gets you the reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Praise the Lord. When God showed Abram the land that his descendants are going to inherit, he told him that everything as far as he could see would be his, right? But the land was full of Moabites, Hittites, Canaanites, and Amorites. And they would all be future enemies of Abraham's offspring, Israel. And so it is when God speaks to us and gives us a word or a vision, the enemy comes immediately to attack that. And even though the promise is yours already, amen, there are certain enemies that you have to confront. The main being your sight telling you your circumstances are not going to change. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. I'm about to wrap up here. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. This blesses me. When... Wherefore, seeing we also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Think of this. Think of Doak. Think of my sister, my brother, you know, different ones who were believers. They're the witnesses. They're watching us. And the great, about a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so doth, doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Hey, they know the truth. We may look at it like, as you say with Doak, and wonder, why? I mean, we know that's the will of God. This great cloud of witnesses, they've already arrived and they're telling us, look, don't back off. Do not give up. Do not give in. Don't let circumstances, don't let the natural things you've seen or experienced dictate to you the Word of God or what God has a purpose for your life. They're, they're like cheerleaders up there going, don't give up. Keep on. Keep fighting. Keep fighting. We're going to have a victory and we're going to be celebrating that same victory with you. We, we paid the ultimate price for faith. 
Now, don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Don't become cowards. We're with you. You can make it. Just don't give in. James chapter 1 and verse 4. Last scripture here. James 1 and 4. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete or entire, wanting nothing. Nothing left undone. Not, no, no part of the vision left unfulfilled. Let patience have her work. When you've done all this to, to stand, stand therefore. The vision has to come to pass if I can find somebody who won't give up on it. Who will stand in faith in spite of all the natural things going on around. Of all the reasons, the temporary reasons why you should not believe it. But keep the vision and it must come to pass. Amen. Others who went before us had their faith tested. And were able to stand fast, patiently. Able to win the race. They won the race. They didn't lose. They won because it's won by faith. Let's do the same thing. Let's move from sight to vision and see what God will do. Amen? Amen? The unbelievable, the unexpected, the impossible. Amen? Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate your patience. Amen. Let's walk in vision. Hallelujah. By faith. And we will see the miracles, the miraculous, the supernatural take place in this world. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.